Hey, welcome to the Framing CPA channel brought to you by Atlanta Business Accountants and I got a treat for you today. Today we're going to talk about rental properties. Now, in this economy, there's been a huge real estate boom and it seems like everybody has their hand in some sort of rental real estate game. So obviously, um, we've seen a lot of different rental um, situations come across our way over the years. And quite honestly, I've been in the rental real estate uh, industry for many, many years going back to basically right out of college. And I worked as a co-op condo auditor for the rental real estate um, industry back pretty much right out of college. And I've also worked as a real estate property manager, as well as have had many different various clients come to our office for assistance with their rental real estate activities. And that would include people from many different walks of life within the rental real estate or just real estate industry, if you will. And that would include investors, your real estate agents or brokers, um, your flipper, your property development, or somebody that just holds land for investment and buildings, uh, storage facilities, tax liens. I mean, you, you name it, we've had, we have our hand in it one way or another. So today I want to speak to you about the rental real estate world, what it is, what, how is it defined and just kind of try to make sense of it all for you guys and bring it into um, this nice, neat little package where it can hopefully just make things um, light up and understand this pretty complex area of the tax code. All right. So let's jump right in. Um, let's talk about what is rental real estate and why is it so important? Why is it so unique? Um, why is it treated differently? But in order for us to dive into that, we first want to just talk a little bit about how it's reported in terms of your tax forms. All right. So um, what you see here in front of you, um, and I will divert my attention over to this worksheet here. So I'm going to highlight it for you. Now, um, these are three scenarios. OK. And when we're dealing with reporting a rental property, it is reported on Schedule E of your Form 1040. If you're just a regular individual doing rentals and um, we'll dive into more details as how it can be reported in different places. But for now, let's just discuss your very basic uh, rental situation. You know, your average individual goes out and buys a rental property and they're in the business as a landlord now. And um, now they're collecting money from their tenants. And we have three different scenarios here. And um, each column here represents one rental property. And um, the way it would be reflected on a tax return would be basically you would reflect your rental income. And then from the rental income, you would obviously subtract all of your rental expenses and you come out to a profit or loss for tax purposes. Right. Um, and that's really key because we're discussing here for tax purposes and not cash flow purposes. So uh, let me write that down right here. Cash flow, cash flows. All right. Um, so let's let's just look at the income real quick and rental income is just rental income. I'm not going to dive into security deposits, but if you have rental income, we're going to assume um, that in this case, A, it's uh, 22,000 in case B, it's also 22,000 and in case C, it's 55,000. Now, that would be the rental income. And then from that, we need to subtract out all the expenses. And obviously, after we're doing that, we're going to end up with a profit or loss. And um, all the rental expenses are listed out here and itemized. You know, you have your advertisement, auto and travel, cleaning maintenance, anything that deals with this activity is obviously going to be deducted from this activity to come out to your profit or loss. So why do I have three different scenarios here, different costs and um, different rental income, different expenses, because I want to bring home a point. And in most cases, we really have these three scenarios, right? And um, we have a scenario one, which is technically profitable for tax purposes. Then we have what most average renters uh, or landlords rather would have in their situation. That's what we want to refer to as the tax shelter. And then just keep that in mind for now. Um, and then we would have the loss situation. All right. So what does the profitable situation mean for tax purposes? Well, when they bought this property, they bought the property fairly low. It was um, at $150,000. Maybe this property is somewhere next to a technical college and it's being rented out to um, students and it was purchased a while ago. So there's very little financing involved. And so actually for tax purposes, we're dealing with um, a positive taxable income. Now, the key here is that 
when we're deducting our expenses from the rental income, we cannot deduct any mortgage loan returns, right? So when you get a loan from the bank, whether that's a mortgage, whether that's some other loan, it doesn't constitute income. You're not getting taxable income from the mortgage, from the bank, right? What you're getting is just a loan. And when you repay that loan, you're just simply reducing your debts, but the interest portion is deductible, but the loan repayment isn't. So this is where the cash flows kind of come in. So in this particular case, we're not gonna discuss the cash flows in more detail and come out to what we really would wanna assess if we are an investor. Because if I'm an investor, before I get into this $150,000 property, I'm gonna run the numbers and see, does it cover all my costs for cash flow purposes, right? What are cash flows? I'm gonna add up everything, including the loan repayment. So if the loan repayment here is, let's say, 3,000 a year because I paid for this property, you know, almost in cash, right? And so I have, let's say, a very small amount of financing and that finance payment is so small that I only pay back my $3,000. Now remember, that's not deductible for the tax return, but in my pocket, it's still a cash out and I still have to pay that. So in reality, how much am I actually holding worth of cash would have to be um, subtracted out of this PL, and now would have to add back the depreciation, which is a tax write off, is not actually any money coming out of my pocket. And there'll be more on this very soon. Um, but just for now, let's focus on cash flows and let's define depreciation. So when I buy the property and I'm actually financing or buying it cash, it doesn't matter. Once it's in my possession, and I have it sitting there, I have to depreciate this property over a set number of years, and that typically is 27 and a half years. And so here, the depreciation every year, if you take the cost basis of 150,000, divided over the 27 and a half, that depreciation is 54, 54, and 55 cents. But I already, let's just say, paid for it, right? So there's actually no physical cash outlay, right? If I paid it in full, let's say I had $150,000 lying around in cash, I paid for it, um, so I have no mortgage. I, ha I don't have to pay interest, I don't have to repay a bank. So I'm actually getting just paper losses, if you will. They're not actual outlay, but for tax purposes, I have to declare this depreciation. And if I don't, I have to recoup that depreciation in the future when I do sell it and square up with the IRS. More on that later. There's a few pitfalls there I wanna bring to your attention. All right. so. Now that we got the actual concept down, when we come to this profit, and let's just assume again that there is no interest or no capital, I've just reduced my profits by a paper depreciation expense, and hence, I would have to add that back and subtract out any loans to come to my true cash in or my cash out. So that's the concept behind a tax shelter and behind this whole premise of this whole rental real estate. And again, this all came out back in the mid 70s, actually the year I was born in 1976, they started already looking into this rental real estate activity very closely and started coming up with rules and regulations to help address all of the issues that were coming out of this depreciation because people were basically inflating things and creating losses that they weren't really entitled to and so um, that gave birth to a lot of anti-abuse rules and the rules that we basically have today. But let's, let's not um, divert too much and go off tangent. So is everybody with me as far as how this is working in terms of cash flows versus tax profit or tax loss, or as we say, profit for tax purposes or loss, net loss for tax purposes? Okay, so if you're following so far, and um, let's scratch in this scenario for now any cash flow, and for tax purposes, you know, assuming this case A, we're gonna come out to a profit of 59.95 and 45 cents. So it's a great deal because for tax purposes, it's actually creating profit and it's actually getting taxed. And it's, I'm gonna actually pay income taxes on this profit. Um, now, does that happen to everybody? No, of course not. Your average um, landlord that wants to get into the Airbnb situation. And yes, I forgot to mention that we also handle many different Airbnb verbo situations and so on. Um, yeah, so it, the most average individual will not have $150,000 just lying around to plop into um, 
an asset like a home and start renting it out. And, um, you know, so most of us need to basically finance it to some degree. And so we're always dealing with this mortgage and interest and depreciation concept. But where we land within the spectrum really depends on the deal, really depends on the property, and it comes down to location, 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 and actually what you've invested, right? This is the two main keys, the property itself and how much you have down. So that will obviously dictate. But what we typically tend to see is for everybody to fall into one of these three categories. So you have either a profitable situation for tax purposes, you have what we call um, your tax shelter or your average situation, and then you have the tax loss, like the, the money pit, like the worst, worst of the worst, and you're not really in it so much um, to make money, it's more of an investment long-term or something along these lines. And I'm gonna jump right back into that in a minute. Let's talk about the tax shelter. So. I set this up so that you can now understand why it's a tax shelter. Well, because in case B, you're basically creating a tax loss, right? As you can see here, we're coming out to a negative 7,231.82. But that tax loss is really inflated by the depreciation of 81.81 because the cost of the property was 225,000 as opposed to 150. And we're coming out to um, a tax loss for tax purposes but since the mortgage is kind of mo mo mainly paid out, um, there was a lot of cash down, but not full, not as much as in case A, we still end up with um, actually cash outflow, um, a positive cash influx, because we have to subtract back out this depreciation. So we would actually um, add back this depreciation to this P&L, right? And we would say, well, in actuality, that depreciation didn't really cost me anything because I financed the property. So I have to add it back in. So when we actually combine the two numbers, guess what? I'm actually profiting in real terms, $950 for cash purposes. And just as a, just, just stay with me on this. Let's just say your finance costs for the year were 700. And it's not always going to be this way, guys. It's, it's difficult to always um, make the numbers work, but this is technically how it does tend to work for most people. Um, the numbers are not exactly jiving with me because maybe the mortgage interest was less in reality. I just slapped on some numbers because I'm bringing a point home. I'm not going to try to make this a very real life situation. I'm just bringing point to home, uh, uh, um, the point home. So now in case B is your typical situation or what we call the tax shelter is because it's not technically a tax shelter because they did away with them but it's sheltering the taxation because it becomes positive cash flow. So you're putting cash into your pocket every single month. It's profitable for your pocket, but not for tax purposes. On the tax return, it's a loss. And it's a, it's a decent sized loss of $7,200, which you can potentially offset other income. All right, let's jump into the loss situation. So we went through the profitable, the average, and now let's talk about that good old money pit. So. Um, once upon a time, one of my clients bought a property out in Key West and he's had it for many years. And basically, um, it's really a money pit. It doesn't make any money. The land's super expensive and it's a retirement vehicle. It's more of a long-term investment. It's been rented out for many years. And then what ended up happening was that the costs were so great that no matter how much rental income was being generated, it would just always end up a huge tax loss. But the whole point is that this is property that's creme de la creme. You know, the building is worth like almost nothing and it's all about the land. The land is worth in the millions. So of course the property taxes are gonna be astronomical. And since it's getting Key West, the insurance is really high. And then if there's a hurricane that passes through, you might need to rebuild that property and you're just stuck with a piece of land. So that's, but, but it's a Key West property and a very desirable location in Key West. So why would anybody want to um, lose that? Because the appreciation is gonna be greater than the actual uh, losses that you're incurring, especially if you have bigger plans for it in the future and you're looking at it as an investment. So it does produce $20,000 of losses a year. So what? It might appreciate much more, much faster. And so that's, that's where we land, you know, or it could have really just been a bad deal. You know, not everybody out there is making great deals and what everybody values can be completely different. I'm nobody to say, but so that's, that's where we are today, guys. So just the concept here to understand how rental real estate tends to work just on the number side, what is depreciation? 
how that it, that it, how is that being calculated for rental real estate? Um, that it's a paper loss, so you understand that that it's not an actual loss that you have to square up later with the IRS when you do sell this property and you start to take time. I'm going to go over that in more detail in the next segment. This segment is just to cover those three basic situations so that you can get to understand the very basics before we dive into all the minutia that deals with rental real estate. All right, guys, stay tuned for the next one. I'll be with you right back. Thanks, and don't forget, your success is our success every day here at Frame CPA. Thank you.